Hey world, Stephanie Marlowe here. I'm rushing into the Terminus event right now. Uh, I'm speaking thanks to Access Granted at the event. And uh, so I'll check back in with you in a little bit, let you know how it goes. Travis, Keeps, Keeps, Travis. <laughs> Travis. Stephanie. Marketing Trends, Social Media and ROI for AR, VR, and 360 video, um, hosted by Access Granite. Um, and welcome to the last day, the final hours of the Terminus Conference. Uh, as Corey said earlier in a previous uh, panel, it's bittersweet. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, um, we're here on a Sunday. Last night was a big turn up for some of y'all. Saw you guys. Drinking up those, using those free drink tickets. <laughs> so thanks for dragging yourselves in here on Sunday. No, we really appreciate it. This is going to be a really awesome talk and panel. Um, obviously, if you're in here, you're interested or maybe involved in the space of uh, AR, VR, 360 video content creation. But um, my name is Adam Davis McGee. I am uh, a founding partner with Access Granite. Um, who. Uh, we're a small, humble agency startup here in Atlanta. We uh, pride ourselves in uh, providing and working with um, par different partners around the U.S. around uh, ideating with VR and interactive technology solutions for brands, companies, artists, and more in the creative entertainment space, but also in other business solutions as well. Uh, my partners are actually here, James and Ricardo, in the front row. Um, so we are lucky enough to have some people that are here from our local scene, and as well as some people from out of Atlanta, which is always really good. Uh, so without further ado, I'll introduce our panelists, and you guys can get an idea of their backgrounds, and then we'll dive into the conversation, and uh, leave. hopefully, uh, if they don't jabber too much, leave some time for question and answers from you guys. Um, no promises. Uh, so to my left is the amazing Stephanie Marlowe. Uh, Stephanie is founder of Artist Life Vision. Uh, she is a published photographer and videographer based here in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, Stephanie's concepts along with her adventurous visual style thrives throughout her body of work. And uh, Stephanie's continued her photography education and growing knowledge of 360 and VR film and photography and um, has a list of videos in a gallery of tiny world images. Um, out on the internet you can check out. Um, she has a wondrous way of viewing the world and has brought a new level of creativity to existence. Stephanie looks forward to providing more immersive content in the future. Some of her body of work that you can check out right now, which is amazing and has lots of really cool um, interactive followers around the globe. Uh, Treasure Hunt Tuesdays, an engaging uh, arts piece with uh, VR and radical inclusion to community surroundings for youth and adults. It is a actual treasure hunt. That happens on a Tuesday. Um, VR Street Experiences, which is sponsored by Smart Theater VR. It's a campaign around getting headsets into the hands of everyday people who have not yet come close to engaging with VR. It's a really great initiative of giving the technology out to people. Um, her, her and her team are giving away VR headsets through that platform, which is great. And uh, immersive and therapeutic content, where um, they have a, she has a good amount of 360 videos <coughs> shot with the intention of aiding people who suffer from stress, panic, panic attacks, lack of mobility, and so on. So really great, diverse um, application of the technology from Stephanie. Uh, next, we have Lee Keebler, who is the president of Nashville-based virtual reality house Black Box Simulations. Lee has spent years working in both the music and creative tech fields, most notably working alongside Will I Am of the Black Eyed Peas, creating tech installations all, all around the world. His first venture into interactive tech was reverse engineering the Xbox Connect, which allowed him to DJ uh, in the air using gestures. Today, Black Box Simulations focus on creating one-of-a-kind VR experiences for large brands and companies, hoping to connect with the customers in a new way. We welcome Lee to Atlanta, which is great. Um, and last but not least, we have Travis Nunnally. Do I say that right? Yes. 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 Great. Great. <laughs> um, Travis is with Brain Ring Solutions. Um, Brain Rain, and he is a founding and owner, CEO of Brain Rain. Let me specify that. 
Uh, Brain Rain specializes in uniquely leveraging augmented reality and Internet of Things to create ultimate engaging experiences. From interactive, interactive vision centers to stadiums, Brain Rain helps <coughs> increase growth in companies by increasing brand awareness and creating a more loyal following for your business. Some of the highlights from Brain Rain, um, they are retail, beacon, and augmented reality clients. Uh, some of the past their clients have included Lexus, Toyota, UpTV, PBS, AT&T, Laugh Network, Harman, Cardin, and uh, you could talk a little, he'll talk a little bit more about some of those uh, solutions and installations they've done with those clients. Um, really cool, a four and a half average rating in the App Store. It's one of the highest in the industry. I love that note because <laughs> it's very important to rep your overall uh, rating in the app stores as a company. And um, they have a cumulative, uh, cumulative total for increase evaluation at 50 million and counting. So Brain Rain is doing some great work and that is also uh, Travis's here local in Atlanta. So please welcome our panelists. Big round of applause. Really um, Access granted our team. We wanted to carry this, this conversation to be uh, you know, really open. Uh, I've got some kind of guiding questions for the different subject matter. Um, you know, we wanted to go a little deeper with, uh, the, uh, as far as um, the co as conversations go with 360 and interactive tech. Uh, you know, a lot of times uh, we we see panel panels just having the, hey, this is cool tech and this is amazing. This is what the future is going to be like. But uh, we don't often get a chance to go deeper into solutions. So that's what we wanted to offer you all today um, to kind of have these uh, panelists with their diverse experiences and their work that they're doing give uh, some speak to specific case studies and experiences that they're working on. So without further ado, we're going to just dive right into the money. Um, well, money is one type of ROI, right? But uh, the first question that we want to kind of throw out there is uh, kind of like that golden egg is uh, the heavy price of, of, of this um, technology and the slow adoption rate. A lot of companies will and decision makers are always saying, how do I um, mitigate the financial risk in investing in AR solutions? So do, do any of you all want to kind of dump, jump in and take that question of how do you convince these decision makers to take those financial risks in this company, in this? Yeah, I go first. Um, so I, I'm the CEO, so all I do is sell the technology. <laughs> so my job is to make sure that they reduce risk while maximizing um, their ROI. For AR, uh, what we typically look at is start off with a problem. Um, so once we identify what we call a cash suck, right, is this uh, business process. We typically work in the commercial space, meaning that we either train uh, employees, we engage users differently, and it just depends on the problem. So for us, the first thing is identify what the need is. Um, for some people, is they want to make more revenue. For other people, like uh, let's say Lessons so Toyota, for example, is I want to engage my members differently and get a more loyal following because they have a deep loyalty base with their brand. Um, so once we identify what that problem is, then we come up with solutions that uh, return that we estimate a return on investment. Uh, for us, it's just a matter of looking at what the problem is and going through um, from a deep learning standpoint how we can supply some solutions. So. If you look at augmented reality, there's a lot of different applications of what it can do. Uh, you can go from a gamification standpoint and use a, a Pokemon Go, um, you know, a, a, a application, but you also can use it more on a, you know, um, a content distribution platform. So once you identify what that is, uh, then we track the metrics through the technology. Uh, what we typically do is we'll, you know, once we come up with, like I said, there's plenty, many different ways to do augmented reality. Once we find out that flow of uh, from you know problem to some solution where it could be conversion sales then we track through the process of what the ROI is and then we just track the metrics from a technology standpoint so like for example if you use an art gallery approach where you hover over and you know the art comes to life or you know uh, if you're using something that augments a real reality scene like you know glitter falls from the sky using that example I uh, will track how many points you know, the user actually hit. So for example, we'll check how many, you know, the, the length of the video, we'll check how many engagements happen, and from there, check how much the, the return investment was from the customer. You guys have any? Sure, I mean, I can speak to it a little bit for the uh, virtual reality um, side of things. Um, we focus on 
doing VR for corporations, companies, uh, industries, um, some education. Uh, education is becoming a, a larger factor as uh, actually the, the, the youth are kind of driving that forward um, because they're, they're looking for it at that point. Um, but anyways, that's not true there. Uh, from a how do you mitigate the risk, you don't. Um, sometimes the risk is the pitch. Um, and that's that's okay. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, we've got one client who is their end goal is to be seen and change the dialogue. Uh, they manufacture things. Uh, their end goal is to change the dialogue that they are a forward-thinking company, that they are utilizing new technologies, and that they are going to bring them the future of this particular type of manufacturing. Um, and so they started down the VR realm to start that dialogue. In that particular sense, the risk was actually the message uh, that this is a company that is willing to take risks, and uh, they're going to. And, and it was very calculated, and uh, it was a risk that was worth taking. Um, it doesn't mean that uh, right before they signed off on the final product that they were a little nervous. Uh, then they saw it and they felt very comfortable um, because I mean, we were talking, we were doing this about a year ago. Um, and so no one was really bringing this to the manufacturing scenario at, at this point. Um, the other side of it is uh, we've also got clients who are very calculating and they don't are very risk adverse and they don't want to take those risks. Um, and we've learned that with them, we were just kind of like, well, that's kind of part of the game. It is part of it. This is new technology. This is, we cannot tell you uh, how, I start almost every time I talk about this by saying one simple thing, and, and it very still holds very true, and that is no one can tell you what to do, and that's the bad news and the good news. You know, uh, the good news is no one can tell you how to do this, and the bad news is no one can tell you how to do this. So you're kind of on your own, uh, and we're slowly building up what makes for good experiences in this realm. Uh, the, the financial answer, the ROI answer, is uh, understanding what it is that you're doing and why it has value. If it's simply doing it to show off, that's probably, I mean, some, in some cases, that's totally fine. Now, most, a lot of trade show presentations, that's what is being done and that has uh, actual value. Uh, but when you start talking about building tools for VR, uh, what needle is that moving? How, if their investment is X, what is gonna be the return? Um, and so in manufacturing, that's huge because it allows us to uh, demo things in VR without having to manufacture it first. Oh, I wanna build this big, heavy, clunky, expensive thing, but I'm not sure if it's gonna be good for a person who's five foot five or if they have to be six foot tall or what if they're five foot flat? Like, it's weird, but those are the questions that we have on a daily basis. And so knowing that, it's like, okay, yeah, this is a very expensive application that we're designing for you. It's also gonna keep you from making some really stupid preliminary mistakes that you can't do until you build it and stand in front of it. Um, so if you're answering those questions, your value becomes extremely strong on the ROI uh, argument. Staying on that topic and, and speaking to your client's needs, uh, you've been able, Keeves, you and the, your Black Box team have been able to take um, you know, what could have just as easily been some one-off solutions for like a trade show, for example, but you all have been, you've managed to turn it into a long-term partnership uh, mm -hmm. or what's becoming a long-term partnership. Can you speak to uh, kind of yeah. some of the tips around that? And that was never, uh, we always had in the back of our heads that maybe that was something that was gonna happen, but it was never the end goal um, because we are talking about very new technologies here. Uh, the best advice that I can give anyone going into AR, VR, or 360 video is listen to the client. The market's going to tell you exactly what works and what doesn't work. Um, and so we built a trade show for a kitchen manufacturing company. Uh, they built stainless steel kitchens for a lot of big fast food restaurant chains. Um, it wasn't until I started working with this company that I walk in the fast food restaurants like, wow, there's a lot of stainless steel in here. Uh, and that is big, bulky, heavy, and expensive. Um, and so they, they were honestly, uh, I will say what I can say without ever breaking NDAs. So I'm being very careful about my, my wording. Uh, but they were really tired of, um, they wanted to present a more forward thinking application, but they were also really tired of shipping a stainless steel kitchen to a trade show. It's big, it's bulky, it's heavy. 
Um, and expensive. It's expensive. If it gets damaged on the way there, you're putting out a damaged good. Like there is not a backup because it's, you have a, you send a kitchen, right? Um, and then you have to polish it, and fingerprints, and all of these things that you never think about are being <coughs> people's everyday problems for an industry you know absolutely nothing about, and you just wanted to go play in VR. Uh, and then you're like, oh yeah, that actually has a good application. Um, and so we built their trade show booths, and in doing so, uh, we learned a lot about the industry. They learned about a lot about what, how they were interacting with people. We learned a lot about VR um, because we were putting people through VR who had absolutely one no background in it, and two no interest in it. Uh, probably the latter being the most valuable. Um, they weren't against it. They weren't opposed to it. They just genuinely they were showing up to. Uh, kitchen manufacturing show and had no interest in this. Uh, and so um, we put them through it and then those people were coming out of the headset with a really good experience and a really good, surprising adopted knowledge of that experience and what the product was. And then they started telling the, our, our client um, what they wanted in VR. Uh, and so then that client was kind of put in a position where they kind of had to do it. because. Cat was out of the bag. That, I mean, that's the dialogue that we have on a daily basis. It's like, oh, we actually, wow, um, this was supposed to solve a trade show problem, and now it's solving a design problem, a manufacturing problem. Um, we, we need to go deeper. We need to go further. And so that has turned into a really fantastic partnership, um, and as it has with, uh, you know, architecture firms are big uh, for partnerships. Um, a lot of edutainment stuff. We're, we're doing some museum work right now, which is definitely a partnership. And it all can, comes from we're solving one problem, and then it, it's a tool. Jumping over to the idea of sharing and introducing the technology, Stephanie, I know you could speak to this. Um, you have a very large body of work online right now. Um, you can you can boast something that I, I don't think many people can, which is you have thousands of views on your work. Stephanie just recently won first place in the AT&T um, um, Creators, creative, Creators Challenge. Yeah. The Creatathon, um, yeah. first place with a VR film that was just a few weeks ago, already has over 12,000 views online around the world. Um, can you speak to uh, kind of looking at the viewership of your work and just the analytics, like kind of what you're doing, what's working, um, what you find with sharing, you know, like Treasure Hunt Tuesdays, all these different things that you're creating. Uh, can you want, to, you want to speak to some of that in the social media sharing yeah. kind of realm? Absolutely. So. My, my biggest, uh, I guess, base for broadcasting has been using the Veer VR app. Uh, that's what's actually pushed me globally, and that's what pushed the AT&T contest winner uh, video, the Dream Collection Agency video. Um, YouTube, as far as the social media, I'll cover that really quick. Um, YouTube hasn't done as well. I think that it's because uh, you have your people who are looking for 360 entertainment, and then you have your people who don't know to look for 360 as entertainment. Um, and I, I think once YouTube starts pushing a little bit more, maybe advertising, I know they've got a lab that they're starting now. Uh, I think that'll change on YouTube. Um, what I'm seeing is that people just really, I'm getting the same amount of views on every type of video I do. It doesn't matter if it's underwater or if it has a, a talented you know, uh, main person like Treasure Hunt Tuesday, we have Captain Gatsby. He's <coughs> such a talented, just eclectic person that He's always going to bring people and views, you know, just being himself. Uh, but you know, I put a camera in the water with catfish, and on the different uh, Veer, Visual Pathy, and View 360 apps, I get the same amount of views either way. Um, I'm getting the same amount of comments, the same amount of likes, and I think that's all based on the description. Um, I'm putting it out there, you know, the the underwater one that's going to be for children. Uh, people who are interested in aquatics and, you know, somebody who might need a place to just get away. You know, maybe somebody who loves aquariums and that's how they relax. Well, now they can go into VR and just get into their Zen moment. Um, so as long as I seem to make the descriptions relative to what's within the content, um, I'm, I'm getting a mass amount of different viewers and they're all coming to my channel for whatever their specific viewer type is. Um, thankfully, uh, a lot of the apps, I'm, I'm working with uh, the developers to help um, kind of bridge the gap <coughs> between the viewer and the creators, um, make everything a little bit more navigationally friendly. Um, yeah, so that's, you know, um, Facebook, 
Uh, that's one of the main questions I've had from different uh, people is how's Facebook doing because they've got such a huge push right now. And I'll tell you, Facebook has actually flopped for me personally. Um, I'm pretty decent with SEO. I've had my accounts for a long time. They're definitely, you know, grandfathered in to say. Uh, but I will get more views if I uh, post a YouTube link on my page on Facebook than if I upload a 360 video. And it doesn't matter. I've tried, you know, hashtagging, not hashtagging, describing, not describing, just putting the video up. You know, I've tried doing these these different things <coughs> strictly from my page, and I, I'm I'm really shocked at the amount of or the little amount of uh, feedback I've gotten. So uh, for me, um, I'm sticking within the VR community currently because I know that's what's going to actually uh, bring me some money back to be able to continue being a content creator. And one of those communities that she mentioned initially is Veer, which I, some people may not be uh, familiar with. I wasn't familiar with it mm -hmm. until you introduced me to it, but that's V-E-E-R. Um, it's a great community right now that's building Wonderful around the world. Community. Um, Kind of still sticking to this, uh, you know. Obviously, a lot of people just heard about Apple's announcement with the AR kit. Um, as far as going in social media in the AR world, or some of the successes that you all, uh, Travis, uh, have seen with some of your clients to engage and to have kind of the stickiness factor with developing AR content um, in the social media sphere. Verse anything you want to share or speak to on that? Uh, yeah. So for us, um, we look at AR as a a tool for engagement. Um, so we, we look we approach any marketing in two ways, right? The intimacy of the relationship, but also the frequency of the relationship. So think of it like this, you know, if I keep following up with you, then you're gonna become a deeper member for us, you know, a deeper, you know, have a deeper loyalty as a customer. Um, but also if I enhance the intimacy, then you also have a deeper um, loyalty to me as a customer. So when we approach our clients, we look at it from, okay, if you're using it as a customer application, so there's two, there's two ways to use really AR. Um, as a customer application, meaning that you're engaging with some, you know, Toyota Nessa, they're engaging with their dealerships. Um, for us, either using it as a customer application or business process application, meaning that it's um, some way of enhancing training. So think of a mechanic, you're going to a, uh, uh, a kitchen and you're trying to fix a sink, right? And you don't you recognize a part if you look at the part, we can use AR technology to do rec um, part recognition. Um, so one of our major wins is uh, we invested and started, helped start a company called Partpeak, uh, which was recently acquired uh, by Amazon. Um, then also some of the other wins were more in the sales space, meaning that it's almost trade shows, right? We're trying to help the customer create an a experience where they can help convert a, uh, a lead into a customer. And those are into the Lexus Toyota space where they do innovation centers. Um, they use our technology for innovation centers as well as uh, a lot of TV broadcast brands like Up TV, Bounce, Lab TV, Escape. Um, they use it for sales when they're going to advertisements. Um, so like I said, it's, just, it's so many different applications for AR and VR um, that you know, it's just a matter of making sure that you identify first what the problem is and come up with creative solutions around that problem. Nice. So I like that marketing and frequency yeah. equaling the intimacy and the mm -hmm. engagement. Um, I'm taking notes too. Yeah. <laughs> um, kind of going, jumping over to the marketing trends. Uh, I mean, since you just started, you mentioned marketing uh, specifically. This is a question I don't think we hear often, but what are some of the trends that you guys just don't like right now that you're just not feeling? Spend a couple minutes on the negative and go back to the positive. Anything that has top of mind? If you're going to go down the route of developing and creating VR for commercial experiences, also research how to properly sanitize your headsets. <laughs> yes. Please. Yes. I'm sick and tired of seeing, oh, I've got a VR installation. Great. I'm not putting that on my face. <laughs> it's nothing personal. It's hygienic. Um, yeah, that's got to be one of my, my bigger bigger pet peeves. Um, also, I, I can speak fairly granular about VR as installation, so I'll give a couple of points of things that I really don't like seeing. Uh, it just it hinders the experience. Um, you're, if you're developing for VR, that means that you at some point uh, went out and bought a VR headset and you've played some video games, right? Because um, that's kind of everyone's approach to, or first introductions. Like, I got the HTC Vive, which is a fantastic headset, by the way. 
Um, and so I got it and I went through the demo. And the demo teaches you Vive's best practices for video games. Now, if you're doing video games, pay attention to it. It's actually really, really good. But we're talking about commercial applications. And in commercial applications, you have to actually meet people where they're at. Uh, which means that um, for our installations, we actually turn off most of the buttons. Uh, most people who are having to go into VR for the first time, um, they don't, you don't have the time to teach them how to use the controllers. Mm -hmm. So we'll turn everything down to one button and it'll be a one button experience to the point that I normally turn it down to one controller, one button. Um, anyone who knows me personally knows that I'm uh, uh, an avid and borderline obsessive Atari fan. Uh, and the reason why I am isn't because I think their games are a lot of fun. I mean, there's much better games out there now, fast forward into the future. But what, they've, what they did that I'm not seeing anyone do uh, with VR is they, are, they met people where they were at with that technology. And you have to do that when developing for VR. Um, you know, you had a, a joystick and a button. Two buttons would have been too confusing for people who never had an arcade in their home. That's something to really wrap your head around. I mean, it seems comical for us that it's like, oh, two buttons is too much, because I mean, I grew up with the NES and we had two buttons. Uh, but no, you actually had a joystick and a button because they were mimicking what was known in the arcade machines, right? So we're doing the exact same in VR. Uh, the person is the joystick, because you can walk around. But we're just giving them one button, because it's the, okay, trigger a function. We have to meet people where they are with technology. Uh, when I go to a trade show or I go to an event and someone's got a booth set up to demo VR and all of a sudden they've got to teach someone how to teleport. No, uh, they don't got time for that. Like this has got to be a five minute experience because you got to move people in and out of these things and you don't have time to teach them that. You will lose for you in every single person who goes into a VR experience and most of the time it's for the first time right now. You'll lose 30 to 45 seconds in wow factor. You will lose 30 seconds with this. 30 seconds out the door. So if you're trying to get them in and out in, a, in some type of commercial environment to show your product or to uh, expound on a message, you have to calculate for that. Otherwise, you're gonna have a person in there for like eight minutes. And that's when, uh, you know, quick anecdotal for this, HTC themselves were, uh, in the early days of launching the Vive, were going to things like Lollapalooza to demo the Vive. And they actually had a really negative reaction because they had a, they brought like a trailer out that had three Vives set up in it, like three to five, depending on what event they were at. And they had people going through, there was so much general interest, but they didn't have a timing factor calculated that they had 300 people in line. Mm -hmm. You know what happens to the, the <laughs> number 300 guy? They yeah, they, well, they get angry. They get angry. Because they're the blinding movement. And because you're, you're, you know, you got your guy in there demoing the latest video game and he's not getting out. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. Those are the things that irritate me. Right. Yeah. Anything else? For the trend that we don't like? We can move on. Uh, just a piggyback. Um, with AR, it's, it's the exact same thing. Um, you want to make the experience as simple to use as possible. Like, literally. Like, either point, click, show, <coughs> click a button. Like we actually, uh, we, we split test different buttons to start our AR experience. Uh, we found out the bigger the button, the more uh, positive reaction we have. So we literally lose, use this gigantic button and say start. <laughs> um, and then you, you, know, you go into our AR experience. Um, so it, you know, we found out that we split tested a lot of different user experience techniques. Um, the ones that work is just the ones that just keep it as simple as possible, the kiss method. Method, right? Keep it simple. I don't want to say stupid, but you know, <laughs> super soft, silly. silly. Yeah, right. Um, so for us, it's a matter of okay, you know, the one the trends that, that don't work is if you keep it too uh, complex, and then it tends to die off, right? Uh, Pokemon Go, for example, uh, it was a great, great trend, right? Millions went past Twitter in a matter of weeks, um, but they're starting to die off because you know they're not first. They don't have stickiness. People are not going back to application. Um, they're not effectively using some technologies that's basic for um, for uh, app creation, like for example, push notifications, right? Uh, you want people to come back, you want to say, hey, Pokemon's around the corner, go go get your Pokemon, you know? Uh, so things like that, that they could have used a little bit better. Um, 
but it's really, you know, I, I tried the game, but it, it became so complex <coughs> of figuring out what these orbs mean and all this, you know, that I kind of dropped off. Uh, so if they would have kept it, uh, a, you know, a really simple user experience, then I think I think they would have had a lot better uh, reaction to their technology. Go ahead. Um, one thing that I've noticed in giving the experiences and handing out the headsets, and I'm handing out a base level headset. It's plastic. There's no remote control, no technology. Just put your phone in. Very simple. And what I'm finding, what I'm finding to be a problem is is people. Um, I will approach people, hey, have you ever experienced VR or a 360 video? And people will literally tell me yes, very confidently. And then I'll, I'll say, okay, great, so have you watched it on YouTube? Or you know, where, where have you seen this? And all of a sudden they'll be like, oh, well maybe I haven't quite seen it. So my problem that I found with people is they don't like to be out of the know. Um, so instead of asking people, hey, have you experienced it? I now approach them with, have you ever heard of Ar Artist Life Visions? 360 video content, or have you found us anywhere? You know, or I'll I'll take a little bit different approach because I think the just the simple term VR scares the shit out of people. Mm -hmm. Like really, because they don't want to they don't want to appear stupid, um, especially when it comes to some basic entertainment that we've all been hearing about since we were children. You know, um, so that that's just one thing I can definitely speak on is you know maybe maybe try and think about the words that you use uh, when you're approaching people um, because. They, they seem to get very uh, defensive when, when they don't know right off the rip, and it's, it's bad for all of us because we can't teach them what they need to know to experience and then uh, spawn more for the industry for all of us. You know, so. there, there was something that I wanted to add that you kind of touched on that really hit home of this uh, assumption of people knowing what they're getting into. Mm -hmm. And from a development standpoint, uh, and that approach of knowing where people are at uh, is actually not just in the sense of um, have you experienced VR or not. That's a great place to start because that <coughs> kind of tells you a lot. Uh, but we've actually noticed, um, especially with doing as many trade shows as we've done, we'll push 500 people a day through an experience um, because we try to limit it to the right time to, to allocate that many people. When you push 500 people a day through an experience and you're doing this over and over again and this is a full business for you, you get a really good data set about how people react and respond in VR. So we have very strict rules of how we develop. Um, and they're not rules because um, this is how I said to do it. It's like, no, these are rules because this is how they said to do it. Um, even if they didn't realize that was the problem. And we've actually even noticed that there's um, somewhat of a generational gap of how people respond in VR. And one is not right and one is not wrong. Um, it's just simply a different approach to how the technology is perceived. Uh, the biggest one that we had is the first installation we did. Um, we noticed that in, from about, this is a very loose number, it goes in any direction, but around 40, 45 and up, up uh, saw the uh, VR controller as a different object than people who were 40 and below. So if, um, we had a scenario where it was <clears throat> this is an object in VR and uh, if they were 40 and below and I said okay take your controller and go pick up the object they would go and they take their controller and they would literally touch it and pick up the object and they move it away that's how I interacted with VR <laughs> I was able to record the majority of it. Unfortunately, it did cut off in the middle. So hopefully you got some of the good information from the panel. It was really, really wonderful that Access Granted had us out on their panel. I really enjoyed the other speakers that were on the panel. It was overall, I think, a, a really, really good dynamic between speakers. And I can't wait to attend Terminus next year. All right, I'll see you guys soon. I hope you enjoyed the show. <laughs>